Is it possible to persuade skeptics about Christianity on the internet? Has Dr. Craig Keener proved the ongoing existence of supernatural miracles beyond a shadow of a doubt? Well, today we're going to talk to my good friend Lonnie Robison, an apologist and the author of over a dozen books. He's a man after my own heart and that his writing is split between apologetics books defending the faith and answering the questions of skeptics on the one hand and fictional murder mysteries on the other hand. You can find his books on Amazon under his pen names Og, Keep, and Cliff Robison. That's the introduction. Let's dive into the interview. And here we are. We are joined by international man of mystery, Lonnie Robison. And I call him an international man of mystery because he has more than one name. Uh, Lonnie, I understand you have written books under three different names, not your own. So I guess I should start out by asking, how many books have you written? Altogether, I I think the count right now is 14 that I have self-published. And because you are on the run from the government or something like that, you have written them under three different names, right? Well, yes. The government was not actually involved, I have to confess. You know, not even that time that I got kicked out of Canada. There, yes, there are there are three names that I've written under, uh, Og Keep, and I had a particular reason for using that one. Cliff Robison, that's basically my middle name, and then uh, Anthony A. Ardvark. So Anthony has two A. It's going to show up very high in uh, any sort of alphabetical list. Uh, the name I'm really interested in, I, I think I know where Cliff Robison comes from. The name that's really interesting to me is Og Keep, which is nothing like your real name. How did you come up with that name? Well, Og Keep is just this guy, you know. The the idea, I had been, how should we say, smiting some infidels on the internet. And that arose as a result of, you know, I would be on a forum minding my own business someone would start a religion thread and it was just ridiculous. And so I would reply Mm. to that. And so there was a lot of give and take back and forth. And so I found myself saying the same things over and over. So I wanted to just put it down in writing once and be done with it. And I assigned that caveman apologetics. The idea was just, you know, apologetics for the everyday caveman. And Og Keep, Og the Caveman, was actually the author of the first edition. As it happened, uh, there was a a lady, Maggie Pagratis. Maggie helped me to recreate the second edition, which, and she suggested that I change the name, although she got why I used Og the Caveman. She thought that something with more of a last name might be better. She suggested Keep as, uh, for example, uh, your brother's keeper. And so that was kind of the idea of where Og Keep came from. Gotcha. So you've published several books under the name Og Keep, including uh, Caveman Apologetics, which I have right here, and uh, How to Be a Christian, which is somewhere over my left shoulder, uh, and a few other books. And and, and so you, you started writing apologetics works, at least, because of your interactions with atheists, skeptics, agno- agnostics, etc. on the internet. What kind of fruit have you had? What kind of results have you had in discussing on the internet with skeptics. I'll, t- I'll tell you my experience. My experience is that we are roughly five or 10 times uh, more stubborn and hard-headed and freer with our words on the internet than we are in real life. And therefore, it can be really difficult to have a rational conversation with somebody who disagrees with you. How have your efforts been met on the internet with people who don't agree with you? Uh, well, I have to agree with you that. Um Something about being on the other side of a computer tends to make us dig in our heels and and be absolutely hard headed. Mm-hmm. I have had a very small percentage of internet atheists with whom I have been able to have a productive dialogue, and by a productive dialogue, I mean at the end of it, I could say that if we met each other on the street, neither one of us would put up fists. That's good. That's good. <laughs> you know, we might even be willing to buy each other a cup of coffee. That that kind of, but. Um, you know, the largest percentage, it turns into did not, did so, did not, did, did so. I think that the, the fruit in that is really more that I've had several people say, thank you for responding to this person. And, you know, it's, it's not that it was weakening their faith, but that they didn't know what to answer. And they were concerned that no one was answering that point. Mm -hmm. I've had one or two 
and, and I'm going to distinguish here between atheists and anti-theists. Yeah, an, an atheist is just someone who doesn't believe in God. An anti-theist doesn't think you should either. And they want it to be a law that you can't either, um, you know, or, yeah. or they would really like it if it was. So, you know, with anti-theists, there's no direct fruit. They are dug in. They are militarized. With atheists, I've had productive discussions once or twice. And although they don't seem to change their position, they will at least say that they've got something to think about. So, you know, I'm going to say it, it's smiting the infidels online as much fun as it is, is not really a fruitful and productive way to spend your time in general. Yes, I agree with that. And I appreciate your distinction between an atheist and an anti-theist. And I've had quite a few encounters with both. I find atheists to be much more reasonable and rational than anti-theists. Although I do occasionally find anti-theists that enjoy debating for the sake of debating. I have a pretty active Twitter account and From time to time, I will follow clumps of writers and then interact with the writers that either message me back or follow me back. And it says on my profile that I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a writer. And and sometimes I'll follow people that would be of quite a a bit of the opposite persuasion from that. And every now and then they'll message me and say, hey, why did you follow me? Was that some sort of an accident or whatever? And I, I say, you know, I actually like interacting with skeptics and atheists and people like that. I don't hate atheists. I love atheists. And you're a writer. I'm an, a writer. I thought we might have some, some things in common. But just a few days ago, I got a direct message from somebody called The Flux Apex on Twitter. And they said, and we have to censor this on the fly because it's full of foul language, but they said, not sure what would have made you follow me, but I'm most definitely not someone you want to be following Religion is a plague, and those who spread the disease are parasites. Yeah, your piece of blank blank can most definitely blank off. So, And then he blocked me after that. And that is a pretty good example of somebody who is an anti-theist. Have you ever met in real life, not on the internet, have you met an anti-theist, somebody who is so aggressively anti-God that they don't, they're not just an atheist, they're an evangelist for the other position? You know, I, I can't say, I can't say for certain that I have. I know I have met several people who had some very serious doubts about Christianity. I, I don't think I've met someone in real life who didn't want anyone to be a Christian and thought it was a plague on humanity. Yeah. I have very, very rarely met those kind of people. Uh, I think most people who are radicals online are cream puffs in person. I I think there's a bit of hypocrisy in that. And I'm not just talking about, not just talking about anti-theists. There's also some Christians who are chest thumpers online, but in real life, they're a little bit more of a milk toast and perhaps we should avoid that. I want to read something from chapter 10 of your book on caveman apologetics. Then we'll move into talking about the reasons to believe apologetics conference that you're talking about. But I just think this is a really good thing section you wrote. And you say here, a large part of atheism is bad religion. It often seems like most atheists become atheists because someone somewhere malpracticed his religion. One man who was very dismissive of Christianity told me that as a child in Nebraska, he attended a Methodist church where the subject of every sermon was the fact that the Methodist minister wasn't paid as well as the Presbyterian minister down the street. To this man, religion was a business. It was the sale of guilt. You might say that people like this are inoculated against religion. They've had just enough to render them immune. Of course, we know that Christianity is not for sale, nor is it about guilt. In fact, true religion frees us from guilt. We need look no further than Isaiah 118 to see it. Come, let us Counsel together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I appreciate your pivot there, moving from talking about people wounded by religion into the core of that is grace and the gospel and and what Jesus has done for us. And I I think you're absolutely right. Most anti theists don't get there necessarily because of their philosophical beliefs. Now, I believe there are you know many atheists out there who are there because of their philosophical beliefs, but an anti-theist is somebody who, generally speaking, has been wounded by the church, has been wounded by Christians, has been wounded by religion, and 
I try to be patient with those kind of people because I've seen those kind of woundings in church and probably have done some myself. And the fact of the matter is we humans sometimes hurt each other. And there's some people out there that are really wounded. And I appreciate your books, Lonnie, and your ministry because you are seeking to rationally reach hurting people and people who have questions. So I appreciate that. And along those lines, why don't you tell us about the Reasons to Believe Apologetics Conference that is coming up this summer with Dr. Mike Lacona? I'm glad that you asked that. We're very excited about this. Uh, Valley Baptist Church is sponsoring this. This is our first annual apologetics conference. It is sponsored in part by the Young Adults Program called Rock Gen. It is uh, also sponsored in part by the Youth Ministry. What we're hoping to do is to offer concrete reasons for belief, not just my parents said so. One of the issues that has been identified in the church today is that quite often children hear the gospel. When they're very young, they accept it because their parents say so. But then somewhere, I believe one one apologist has said that it that surveys have said between, I think Greg Kokel said, that somewhere between 10 and 17, many of our youth start to what they call deconstruct or move away from mm-hmm. the faith because they start to say, well, what I learn in school doesn't match what I learn in Sunday school. You know, in, in school, they tell me that things don't happen this way, but in Sunday school, this happens all the time this way. Something here doesn't match. And I think that that's a struggle that many of us go through who were raised in the church. I know I went through a struggle like that. It's it's a kind of a thing that we can we can deal with. We just need to show that there's no conflict between Christianity and science. To me, it was if I put science and Christianity in a steel cage death match, you know, it would be a thunderdome. One would go, two go in and one comes out, you know. But no, actually, yeah. you know, there was no conflict at all. So I think what we're trying to to do here is show that, well, part of it, we would like youth to think for themselves and not just hear something and say, you know, that makes more sense than what my Sunday school teacher said. It would be good if we could get people to evaluate things intelligently, to think for themselves. And then we really want to kind of put something in there that will that will give them tools to do that reasoning, give them tools to weigh, is this true or is this not true? And as you know, the Apostle Paul said, if Christianity is not true, we are, I'm paraphrasing here from 1 Mm -hmm. Corinthians 15, 17, if Christianity is not true, we are the most pathetic of all people. And so that's, that's kind of what we're, what we're hoping here is to, to, to start working against that. And so that's our goal here. So we're very excited about this and we're hoping that this will turn into something. Yeah. And you got Mike Lacona as a keynote speaker. I don't know Lacona personally, but I have several of his books. His mentor is uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, who uh, taught me apologetics. I am a huge Gary Habermas fan. And uh, Lacona is an interesting guy, especially for the goal of this conference, which is to show there's not a there's not a problem between science and religion. It's to show the reasonableness of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Lacona is a guy who will go out there on YouTube and debate atheists Mm -hmm. and debate skeptics and debate people from uh, the Mormon religion and Muslims and things like that. And Bart Ehrman, which is probably one of the best selling religion writers in the United States. He is uh, agnostic heading towards atheism, but uh, sells a lot of books for reasons I can't quite fully understand. But Lacona will get in the ring and go toe to toe with scholars like Bart Ehrman and more than hold his own. And I think it's going to be a great conference. And if people want to register for that, they can go to the website, vbcsalinas.org. And there is a link there to uh, go to the Eventbrite to uh, sign up for that. I I understand it's $20 a person, right? Uh, Yes, that is correct. But that's a problem. Uh, Students should not let that deter them. Uh, There are some scholarships that are available on that. So there, you know, uh, costs should not deter anyone from going. Okay, sounds good. Tell us the dates one more time. Uh, that is June 24th to 26th. At Valley Baptist, Valley Church, Baptist Church in Church. Salinas, California. Yes. Uh, the beach is like eight miles away. It's a good place to hang out. All right, so we're not talking about Dr. Lacona today. We're talking about Dr. Craig Keener's book on miracles. So now that we've gotten the preliminaries out of the way, let's dig in and go a little 
deeper and spend some more time on miracles. We've already had Dr. Keener on the show for two episodes, and we're probably going to do today's episode and maybe one or two more episodes and just have a whole block on miracles because I find it such a fascinating topic. And one of the reasons why, other than your prolific writing, I wanted you to have you own, Lonnie, is because to my understanding, you set the all-time world record uh, speed-wise on reading Dr. Keener's book. Dr. Keener's scholarly book on miracles is 1,248 pages long. It weighs almost five pounds, so more than a half gallon of milk. It is a deadly weapon in the right hands. It is a thick book, and I understand you read it in what? What is it, two weeks? Um, I think I think it might have taken me about three and a half, actually, uh, something like that. Okay, so before we get into some of the miracle stories, just, just give me an overview. What did... What other than, oh my gosh, I'm glad I'm through with that, so, so that, that reading marathon. What is your overall impressions of Dr. Keener's larger of the books he's written on miracles? Well, first, he is extremely thorough. I, I, <laughs> That's a great word for it. He doesn't really repeat things, but he makes his point, and then he makes the point that he made his point, and then he shows you how that point ties in, and then he sets that point aside, shows you another point, shows you how the two points work together. I mean, there it's, I, I believe Dr. Keener himself has mentioned that he has OCD, and I certainly believe it, having read the book. The, the footnotes, endnotes, bibliography, and appendices are actually twice as long as the book proper. I think the book, the, the whole thing altogether is like 3,000 pages, and the book proper is, I think you said 1,248. Yeah, I, I quickly found myself in the appendices and you know it's the way that the book is organized there it's it's very logical but at the same time it does very thoroughly tie things together for example he tells the story some of the stories that we're going to mention but then he also mentions those stories in how they relate to other topics such as can we believe in miracles you know should we accept the human position on uh, anti-supernaturalism, you know, things like that. So it's it's a very, yeah, thorough is the best word. Yeah. And I should mention he has two books on miracles. Really, it's three because he has Miracles Today, which is a more approachable book, uh, around 300 or so pages that is written uh, not just for scholars, but for anybody. That's just come out a few weeks ago. I highly recommend it, especially the Audible edition. If 1,248 pages sounds too long for you, you want to get Miracles Today. But his main work is Miracles 2 Volumes, The Credibility of the New Testament Accounts. And that's what you read, Lonnie. And I, I, when I, Dr. Keener was on the podcast, I described the book as relentless. And I didn't mean that in a bad way. If, if I can use the metaphor of a boxer, if Dr. Keener is in the ring with a skeptic and, and sharing all of these miracle stories... It's like one unanswered shot after another, after another, after another. And there's going to be a knockout Mm -hmm. from all of those blows because I've seen some skeptics online that will take one of the literally hundreds of miracles in Dr. Keener's book and say, well, you know, I doubt this because, you know, it's just a spontaneous remission. We know that sometimes cancer will, will have a spontaneous remission. It doesn't happen a lot. I believe uh, Dr. Keener says it happens one in 60,000 cases of cancer. And so so an atheist will say, this is just simply an example of spontaneous remission and Christians are sort of retrofitting it to be a miracle. Well, maybe you can say that for a few of the accounts in the book. But when I say there are hundreds, I mean there are hundreds and there some of them are not terribly well documented. But most of them are incredibly well documented with multiple attestations, multiple witnesses to the point where you you get done reading them, even the Miracles Today book. And and there's just no doubt in your mind. I honestly don't see how there could be doubt in a rational mind that these sorts of things are still happening. So let's let's go ahead, since you're now one of the talk top experts in the world on Dr. Keener's book. How about you share some stories with us? What, tell us about the Joy, and I'm not going to say her name right. Uh, it's a, it's a, a spelling I'm not familiar with, but Joy Wanafree. Yeah, I, 
um, Wannafried or Wannafred, I'm pretty sure that one of those is probably correct. She is. Uh, she was one of the ones that he mentioned by name. Now, not all of the cases, he didn't always have permission to mention them by name, and he didn't always have permission to share all of their documentation. But he does share as much as he as much as he has. Joy Wannafried. So one of the one of the key things that struck me on this one, she uh, she had an eye condition which caused her vision to be offset higher in one eye than the other. I forget the name of it. I want to say that it's called vertical dis- dyscentia or vertical dysphoria. But one of the, the the effect is that it gives her horrible migraine headaches. And she has to wear very strong, or she had to wear very strong corrective lenses. She was able to drive. She was able to read and function normally, but she needed you know, strong corrective lenses. And she was often subject to migraines where all she could do was sit in a dark room for two or three weeks until they dissipated. And yes, we're talking about weeks in a dark room doing nothing, Mm -hmm. not sleeping, not eating, not thinking, not doing anything except sitting in a dark room. This happened to her uh, at one point during her college years. Several people came together to pray for her. She was healed of this condition. And, you know, she, she went from having an a condition that never gets better by itself to having normal vision, normal 2020 vision. One of the interesting bits of documentation on this is that the uh, the state that she lived in wrote to her to ask her why she no longer needed corrective lenses. Actually, I think they wrote to her op, uh, her ophthalmologist to ask why she no longer needed corrective lenses because that's not something that normally happens. You know, if the if the box is checked must use corrective lenses to drive, you know, then that's, you, you must use corrective lenses. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very interesting that, you know, that, that really shows that first there was a problem and that second, there is no longer a problem. There, something happened there. So that's the first conclusion that we can draw from that. Whether that is, was caused supernaturally. Now, Keener makes an interesting point on this and some others uh, that he just says, you know, if we look at the proportion of these things that are reported, we can say, yeah, sometimes people are spontaneously healed, but how often does it happen just after prayer? And so, mm-hmm. and that that touches on something that's called Bayesian analysis, and he didn't go into Bayes' theorem or anything like that. And I'm not really enough of a mathematician to go through it. You may know some people who do, who do have that kind of background. I think your father-in-law might possibly be someone that would would be a resource for that, but that's just in passing. One of the other cases was uh, Brad Wilkinson. Yeah, Brad Wilkinson is is interesting. A, a lot of the healings that that you hear about, you wonder, uh, is skeptics wonder, is there some sort of psychosomatic element to this? Is it like the placebo effect, in other words? But uh, Brad's case is really interesting. He's an eight-year-old kid mm-hmm. with two holes in his heart. He's going to have surgery and his dad is a uh, is a psychologist. He's a neuropsychologist. Something. His dad is is a very advanced medical doctor of some kind. He's a neuropsychologist and uh, but a bit of a skeptic and a Christian, but a bit of a skeptic. And I, the thing that struck me about this story is the son, the eight year old, uh, leading into this this surgery, asks his dad, uh, "Can God heal me?" And uh, his dad, Ed's first answer is, I'll get back to you on that. And, and then he says, he thinks about it for a while. Then he says, well, God can heal you. But even if he doesn't, you know, we have hope in heaven. <laughs> so this is not the kind of setting where you would expect any sort of psychosomatic placebo effect kind of thing to happen. All right, you take over the story. Of well, um, and that was a good summary. And Dr. Keener uh, even mentions that uh, as the as the time drew nearer for the surgery, I believe the surgery happened in June of uh, or was scheduled in June of 1985. Uh, so this is not something that happened, and this happened in North America. This is not something that happened, you know, a vague story out of China in the 1800s or something. This happened in America in the or in the 20th century. the The boy began giving away some of his some of his possessions, his favorite toys, and things like that, and. Mm. Wow. Typically, that is a sign of someone who doesn't expect to live much longer. And so right. 
eight year old. He kid. was very much aware that he could die, and I think he truly expected to die, or you know that that this was the most likely outcome. It was certainly a dangerous surgery. It was a six hour surgery that was scheduled. The he had been to a miracle healer, a, a healing service. He had prayed to be healed. A few days later, they went in for the surgery the night before they did tests, and the condition was still there. So he was not miraculously healed up until then. So they thought, okay, we are definitely going to have to do this surgery. So this is a case where no one is expecting a miracle. You know, the father is sitting there thinking, my son could die tomorrow, or my son is going to be in surgery a long time, and I don't know what's going to happen. The the next day, he goes into the surgery. The The doctor comes back, the surgeon comes back in about an hour, and this is supposed to be a six-hour surgery. He has the hospital risk management officer with him, and that's always a peculiar (laughs) sign. You know, that's, you know, if anything's going to make you nervous, those two things, you know, why aren't you operating on my son, and why are you worried about risk management? Mm -hmm. And it turns out they were concerned that he might think it was malpractice. So they showed him the films side by side of the night before and there are the holes in the son's heart and the day of the surgery, the films that they had taken that show that it has healed and it is completely wow. filled. There is nothing there. This may, this particular condition, the hole, I believe it's a hole between the two ventricles of the heart. This kind of condition can spontaneously heal in infants, you know, and we're talking two or three days old it can heal. There are cases where that has happened, but never in an eight-year-old and never overnight. You know, it's just, it's simply unheard of. You know, there there are some some kind of funny aspects to the that story as well, like the baseball game that he was in a few days later. Uh, The boy made an outstanding catch and a father from the other team said, wow, that was a miracle. And (laughs) <laughs> uh, sitting there thinking, you have no idea. So, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, that's and that's a very well documented, medically documented case where something happened that we have no explanation for. So a miracle did happen in that it's something we can't explain. You know, was God the cause of that? And that's a question that Keener is not exactly addressing directly in the first part of the book. There, that's not his first mm-hmm. point. So, you know, uh, that's that's just one to think about. The, a couple of others very quickly. One that struck me was when he mentioned the the uh, Dwayne Miller story. And this is one you I know that you have preached on this and you have actually played this recording during the sermon. Yes. Uh, there is a recording of Dwayne Miller being healed. He is he was a pastor. He had a throat infection that caused him to completely lose his voice. I want to call it a mylar sheath, but I don't. That doesn't sound right. Uh, I'm not a. Yeah, it was it was something along those lines, and he lost his voice for years. He had to stop being a pastor. Absolutely, and he could barely speak above a whisper. So at the beginning of the recording, you hear him gasping and whispering into a microphone. The uh, yeah. yes. the class had generously invited him to speak, even. Yeah, he's teaching he's teaching a Sunday school class and it sounds like somebody kind of took pity on mm-hmm. him because you know, he'd been a pastor for years and 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 he couldn't do it anymore so they're like, "Hey, can you you know, substitute teach for our, our Sunday school class?" And initially he was like, "Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. I can't even talk." But then he finally decided to and he carry on. Keep, keep and, going. And he talked about the fact that he had uh, I he this isn't mentioned in in Dr. Keener's book. But on his website, it does mention this. Uh, that's newvoice.org, and you can hear the recording on there, newvoice.org about us. New Voice is spelled in you. And he talks about how he had, he had considered suicide. He had actually gone to the point of having a loaded gun and pointing it at his head and not deciding to kill himself, but thinking about it. Yeah. But on this recording, you hear him at the beginning. He's He is gasping. He is literally whispering into a microphone in order for people to be able to hear what he's saying. And his, his voice just sounds raspy and horrible. And then at a certain point where he's talking about God lifting him out of, you know, God lifting the psalmist out of the pit, as he says the word pit, what Dwayne said was that it was like a hand released his throat. And He said, all of a sudden, he began to speak normally, and you hear a reaction in the background. I did present this this the audio clip to an to a uh, 
I would say the person was somewhere between being an atheist and an anti-theist, but it was a person that I was discussing this with online, discussing uh, the subject of miracles in particular. And he said, well, you know, anyone could make their voice sound like that and then suddenly start talking. Normally, you know, this could be fake. The problem with that is you hear the reaction of the people behind him, the people around him. And I don't know how big this class was. I have the impression that it was a hundred or more people. Yeah. But yeah. it just, you know, you hear people start to like a nervous chuckle, like, <laughs> you know, and then there's like, you know, people are kind of, hey, what happened there? What's going on? And then by the point yeah. where he says, I don't know what's going on right there, people are just full out cheering. Um, yeah. So, you know. He says that he had been to 63 doctors. You know, this is this is uh, Dwayne Miller's statement. But for all ways, means, and purposes, that is about as well documented as a miracle can be. I mean, you can literally hear it happen, and you can hear the reactions of people who are hearing it happen. Now, we don't know Dwayne Miller. We, I don't know him personally. I don't know if you do, but I assume I you don't. don't. No. But the people who were listening to him did know him personally. They knew that he had this condition. They knew that he was healed of this condition. If they thought he was putting on a show, they would not be reacting like that. So we can make a very strong inference based on their reaction. And, you know, that's that's another case that is mentioned in the book there. There's a fourth case I wanted to mention, and that is a woman who is identified as Barbara. Now, Dr. Keener and another man used to go to rest home, a, a particular rest home and conduct services there, a retirement home, a rest home, you know, basically elderly and partially disabled adults would in a group setting and they would have these Bible studies. There was one lady named Barbara who was confined to a wheelchair. She could not walk. And she often lamented the fact that she could not walk. Oh, I wish I could walk. If only I could walk. And one day the other man, not Dr. Keener, but the other man who was there, walked over to her, took her by the hand and said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And mm -hmm. he pulled her by the hand. She got up out of the wheelchair and she walked with him around the room. Could that be psychosomatic? Well, maybe. But, you know, she had been in that wheelchair for years. Her legs would have atrophied. Her legs would not have had the strength to carry her. And she never went back to a wheelchair again so long as Dr. Keener was conducting those services on a regular basis. So that's, that is another, it's another case where you're kind of at a loss to explain it medically. You're at a loss to explain it any other way than a supernatural intervention. Now, you know, that does kind of beg the question, but I think that's a reasonable inference based on the evidence, the, the actual events as they happen and what people saw, what people witnessed. Well, this is a good place to shift gears away from the stories and more into the implications of the stories, the theology of miracles. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you've never read either one of uh, Dr. Keener's books, you should. And I'm not just trying to sell books for right. him. The, you know, I, I only until uh, I've known of Dr. Keener for a couple of decades now. Well, since the 90s, so a little bit longer than that. I have a great deal of respect for him. I don't get any uh, any royalties or any kickbacks or anything like that. But these books are just fascinating because they're such well-documented miracle stories. But beyond just having a bunch of story upon story upon testimony upon doctor's uh, attestation, etc., what does it mean? Like, okay, we got a lot of stories of fascinating things happening what are we supposed to do with these stories? And I know Dr. Keener answers those questions in his book, but I'll, I'll throw it to you, Lonnie. What are the implications of all of these miracle stories? I, I guess let's start this way. Dr. Uh, Dr. David Hume, uh, a, a Scottish the theologian, well, I would call him more of a philosopher right. than a theologian. He formulated what is kind of the gold standard argument against miracles. Basically, it has two planks, one that sort of miracles are a violation of nature, therefore they won't happen. And the other is, I've never personally seen uh, a miracle like is talked about in the Bible, so therefore miracles are impossible. It's it's a very famous argument against miracles. And look, I think there are some really smart, really sharp skeptics out there. There are some uh, people that, that make arguments that are pretty powerful arguments. 
I just happen to consider David Hume's argument against miracles one of the single most overrated philosophical arguments of all time. Maybe that's because of my presuppositions. I don't know. I just don't think it's a very good argument. So I guess my first question to you, Lonnie, is how does Dr. Keener's book and his testimonies and his theology sort of interact with David Hume's argument against miracles? Well, he, he actually talks quite a bit about David Hume. He, I would say probably half of the material up to about page 500, 600 in some way relates to Hume. And the first yeah. thing that he does is he actually attacks the second plank. And he knocks out the idea that we never see miracles happen, therefore miracles don't happen. And you could call that an inductive argument against miracles. And there, first of all, inductive ar arguments are necessarily flawed. There's, there's a problem in them. They're based on what we observe. From what we observe, we draw a conclusion. Bertrand Russell pointed out the chicken that always concludes that some other chicken would get picked for dinner. You know, that's... That's obviously true up until the day that it isn't true. Exactly. So, you know, an inductive argument is not necessarily true. That's the first problem. The second problem is we do have many cases, many events, many miracles that happen around us. So we can't say, oh, miracles never happen. Therefore, miracles never happen. Because among other things, that's a circular argument. The other point there is that when you put the two together, you actually get what's called a no true Scotsman which is an odd thing for an mm -hmm. argument made by a Scotsman. And Somewhat around in, a, in, the, in the no true Scotsman, what you keep doing, well, the classic example, no true Scotsman doesn't like haggis. And so you, yes. you find a Scotsman who doesn't like haggis and you say, here, here is Duncan. Duncan doesn't like haggis. Well, Duncan isn't a true Scotsman because he doesn't like haggis. Therefore, no true Scotsman doesn't like haggis or yes. haggis. I, I'm not sure if it's haggis or haggis. Either way, it's it's a tomato, tomato. Right, exactly. Either way, you know, you have any case that is presented, any specific example is dismissed as by shifting the by shifting the uh, the definition. You know, you exclude Duncan from the definition, and then you say this definition that does not include Duncan is is the group of people who all like Haggis and are true Scotsmen. So, no true Scotsman doesn't like Haggis. Yeah, absolutely. And so what you're saying is that David Hume, who is himself a Scotsman mm -hmm. and himself a logician and himself a philosopher, it gives us in his anti-miracles argument an excellent example of the informal logical fallacy, which is known as the no true Scotsman fallacy. So so keep going. Well done. So well, um, his form of it is, you know, there are no miracles. And if you say, well, this is a miracle, then he'll say, well, that's not a miracle because there are no true miracles. So he's excluding yes, that simple. by using his rule and his excluding that proves his rule. So it's, yeah. it, it's a, both a circular argument in that its conclusion, its premise is its conclusion. And it's also uh, a no true Scotsman. Uh, in short, Dr. Keener really takes David Hume to task. And I Eviscerates he, I would say that he very thoroughly eviscerates him on with with regard to the anti supernatural assumption. Now, the other thing is, if you you know, if you necessarily assume nothing supernatural ever happens, well, that's that puts us back on the same treadmill there. So we could go in a circle. So he makes that's his primary point is that David Hume was just completely wrong. He makes as a secondary point that it is a reasonable inference from these things especially based on the fact that they happen after prayer in many cases, that yeah. these miracles are acts of God and by their very nature imply the existence of God. Yeah. And, and so, so basically what Keener's works do is they take as sort of a foundation an anti-miracles argument, which says uh, uh, miracles are impossible and there's no credible testimony of any miracles. And it's basically doc like Dr. Keener says, okay, here is a thousand, you know, roughly, I don't know how many he records exactly. It's, it's a ton, maybe not quite a thousand, hundreds. Here are hundreds of well-attested, well-documented miracles. Now, what do you have to say to that? And I've seen some skeptics wrestle with it a little bit. I've seen them disprove this one or that one, but 
honestly, it's it's such an overwhelming charge. It's like it's like three or four skeptics in a small fort surrounded by an army of eight or nine hundred people. They're going to get overwhelmed because uh, Keener's work is just so thorough. And Keener's work is not merely so thorough because he's a great scholar, which he is, but it's so thorough because there are so many miracle testimonies out there. And the fact of the matter is he hasn't recorded all of them. He has barely even scratched the surface of them. And so uh, getting past Hume and to the last thing you said, Lonnie, what does this voluminous amount of miracles infer for us? Well, you know, the thing is, and Keener says this himself, not all of these are going to be credible, even though they're documented. They're, you know, it may be that we find that some of these are not true miracles. In that case, it does nothing against our case as Christians. But if even one of these is a true miracle, then even that one by its nature, implies the existence of God and implies that we're not crazy. Yes. You know, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a win win situation for us. If it turns out that every single miracle that he documented was a fraud or a mistake or simple malpractice, you know, if if the the people who had diagnosed Brad Wilkinson had had misdiagnosed the holes in his heart and it turns out they were looking at someone else's x-rays or someone else's films. Even so, that would not disprove the existence of God. But if that that one case or any one case did in fact prove to be a, a real a real violation of natural law, and even that he points out is kind of an ambiguous concept, then even one miracle, one true miracle, implies someone outside of our, uh, someone greater than us did something greater than us. So that's, it's, it's yeah. definitely win-win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that That's the thing. I, I'll say it again. I, I love atheists. I respect atheists, but philosophically, atheism is a very difficult argument to fully make. Agnosticism is not. Mm-hmm. Uh, agnosticism is a pretty easy philosophical position to hold. Atheism is very difficult. You, you could say, for instance, uh, I prayed and God didn't do something. Okay. And you could get 10,000 people together and say, and they could all say, I prayed for such and such thing and God did nothing. But if you got a hundred people together in another auditorium, for instance, and they said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we prayed and God did this very obvious thing. Point being that 10 million people saying, I've never seen any existence, uh, any evidence for the existence of God. I've never seen him answer prayers or anything like that. As you say, one miracle, one movement of God, one verifiable thing is is evidence for the existence and the reality of God. Uh, It doesn't necessarily prove that the God of the Bible is who he says he is. That's a deeper argument. But the argument for atheism is very, very difficult to make because you basically have to invalidate every theistic argument and every religious experience, and you have to have some sort of um, mega knowledge of the universe so as to say, I have looked, there is no God out Mm -hmm. there. And considering we can barely see beyond the bounds of our solar system, and even that we struggle with a little bit, it's just a difficult philosophical argument to make. Well, not only do we believe miracles point to the reality of a supernatural being, we believe that miracles point to evidence for the God of the Bible and his son, Jesus Christ. And what are we, five weeks away, Ilani, from Easter, something along yeah. those lines. So with the last major question of this particular episode, I want to shift gears and turn us to the resurrection, which we're going to be celebrating we should celebrate every day. We're going to be celebrating wholeheartedly and and as big as we can in the next few weeks on Easter Sunday. Lonnie is somebody who has written multiple apologetics works. What would you say is the most convincing argument for the resurrection that if a skeptic came up to you and said, 
I understand the centerpiece of Christianity. The the big claim of Christianity is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And, and he said to you, Lonnie, how do I know that's true? What would you say? What What would be one of the more convincing things you would say to point them in the direction of the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus? Well, um, there are there are several very strong ones. Uh, I really love Gary Habermas' uh, minimal facts argument, where he takes only things that historians accept, and from that he builds a strong, reasonable inference that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, the thing that I think is probably the single strongest is uh, the case of, well, the two cases of the Apostle Paul and James the Just. Uh, both of mm-hmm. these were doubters. Um, both of these were opposed to Christianity. There is reason to think that James and his siblings and their mother tried to have Jesus put away as a lunatic, tried to have him locked up. There is, you know, the Apostle Paul actually was murdering Christians and was was participating in horrible attacks on Christians. But both of these people changed their minds for some reason. Something very dramatic changed their minds. And both of them attribute it to being visited by Jesus Christ. I recently watched a video in which Bart Ehrman appeared, and even he will say there was something that changed their mind, something that made them believe this. Now, he doesn't accept that it was a vision of Jesus, but he he will say, okay, something made them change their minds. Now, you know, I spent most of today in the presence of one of my brothers, and I know how hard it is to get your brother to change his mind on something. You know, <laughs> we we have argued over who was the 13th president of the United States, you know, and neither of us will look it up just just wow. because that would settle it. And then we wouldn't be able to argue. So the idea <laughs> that your brother doesn't believe that you are the Christ and then something happens and all of a sudden he does believe that is pretty strong evidence. Um, and, you know, the Apostle Paul, the fact that he was murdering Christians. And he threw away everything he had, very promising, bright young man with a bright future. He throws that all away just to say, you know, I'm going to go wander around Europe and preach this gospel and have people throw rocks at me until they think I'm dead. You know, that something happened that made that change. Yes. So in your mind, uh, that's the argument you would use. The transformation of Paul and James from enemies and skeptics to true believers. That's probably the strongest one that I would use. There is one other that I think should get honorable mention, and that is your Lithuanian argument. Um, and that <laughs> that's from your book, uh, uh, Easter Fact or Fiction, uh, 20 Reasons to Believe in the Resurrection. Um, basically that, you know, no one, Lithuania is about the size of Judea. Lithuania um you know, very few people could tell you off the top of their head what the capital is or what countries it borders, uh, not unless they have actually studied, you know, that part of Europe or that part of social studies. And yet a country of roughly the same size, the most famous man in the world comes from a country about that size. And he is known throughout the world. How did that movement that started in just this little tiny corner of the world spread throughout the world? without divine assistance. So yeah, that absolutely. is that to me is also a very good argument. Well, I appreciate the shout out. <laughs> Who do you think the 13th president of the United States is? Well, I, it is definitely not Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the, Abraham Lincoln Agreed. was the 16th. Um, the 13th, let's see, the right. eighth was Martin Van Buren. It was, it was one of the, uh, one of the presidents that has a middle initial, I think. Warren G. Harding was later. Okay. It starts with an M, not a duck. Oh, Mallard, uh, Millard Fillmore. Millard Fillmore. You got yes, it. Yes, Millard Fillmore. Yep. All right. Well, I hope your brother didn't have Millard Fillmore in your uh, in your disagreement there. Uh, no, no, and and neither did I okay, for that okay, matter. Good. But you know, just uh, it, it just shows that you know brothers brothers are the hardest people to convince, but somehow Jesus can. <laughs> they they are <laughs> they are well. Hopefully, we'll have accomplished more with this episode than simply in, informing people who the thirteenth president of the United States is. Uh, let's do this. Uh, your books are available on Amazon and other places. Uh, yes, through Lulu.com also. I, say it through one more time. Lulu.com. L-U-L-U. Lulu.com. And so we can search for Cliff Robison yes. and Og Keep. Yep. 
Uh, what would you say, I, I guess I want to ask you what your favorite book is, but the, that's one question. A similar question is what book, if somebody said, give me a book you've written and they were a skeptic or an inquirer, what book would you give them? Okay, that's tough. It, the The last question, I would probably give them either How to Be a Christian or I would, in fact, I have given some people at work the book How to Be a Christian because they kept pestering me with questions. <laughs> Here, this will answer your question. And But probably my favorite is is actually one called The Atheist's Tale. The Atheist's it Tale. It is about a group of college students who determine that they're going to get to the bottom of the question, does God exist? And so they... Wonderful. You know, they, they have a lot of influences. They have non-Christian influences. They have Christian influences. And so there's there are a lot of ideas that they are looking at and discussing. And, you know, a lot of a, a good bit of literature works in there and a good bit of science. One of my secondary goals there was to educate people a little bit more on what science is, because oddly enough, science is not against Christianity. Science and Christianity work together quite well. So Amen. So the, that is probably my favorite book. I don't know if it is the reader's favorite book, but it is certainly it's certainly one of mine. It was the most fun to write. Awesome. And is that under Cliff Robinson? Or that Og is under Keep? Og Keep. Even though that is fiction, it is uh, it is religious fiction. It's under Og Keep. Uh, the Atheist Tale. Okay, 10-4. The Atheist Tale. We will have links to the works by... Cliff Robison and uh, Og Keep available on our website at deepquestionspod.com, or you can simply go to amazon.com or lulu.com and search for Lonnie's works under his many names, including OGKWEP and C L I F F R O B I S O N. Lonnie, thank you for your time tonight, for your insightful answers. I have had a blast talking about this with you. I hope we can have you on for a future episode of the Deep Questions podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We will see you soon with uh, probably a short episode coming up and then another couple of long ones. Good day and Godspeed to you all. Thank you. Good night.